So we are talking about operationalization of your research. In the first uh, lecture, we talked about what is research and quantitative research. In the second lecture, we talked about conceptualization of our research. Then from the third lecture, we have been talking about operationalization of research. In other words, we are exploring the different parts of the method section or the method chapter in your research report. And so, in the previous lecture, we talked about what is your research design? What is your overall plan? Where does it fall? In this lecture, we are going to talk about participants. How will you select the people who will give you the data to your quantitative research? So, we are going to talk about sampling procedures and sample size. Already in the qualitative uh, research uh, method section, we have talked in detail about different techniques of sampling. Largely, sampling techniques can be grouped into two types of sampling techniques, probability sampling and non-probability sampling. In probability sampling, the simple principle is that all the participants in the population have equal opportunity to enter into your sample, probability sampling. So uh, these will call for randomized sampling techniques. Non-probability sampling is based on other criteria like convenience or we talk about snowball sampling because one participant leads you to another participant and they are non-probability sampling in which not all units in the population have equal opportunity to enter into your sampling frame. One remark before we go ahead. We should not think of participants in a research as people all the time. They are just units in a population. So for example, if I'm, my population is all the universities in Kenya, then the universities become my participants, my units for research, my elements for my sample. And from, between, from within the population of the universities in Kenya, I'm going to sample a few of the universities and their units of my uh, research or elements in my sample. Now, let us talk about probability sampling because often quantitative research uses uh, probability sampling so that we can generalize. And because often we want to establish prevalence of a problem or the cause and effect of a problem, then we want to do a probability sampling, a rigorous method of sampling that can lead us or give us a possibility to generalize our findings. Now, we can talk about four types of probability sampling. The first probability sampling technique is called the simple random sampling. Simple random sampling is that all the, all the participants or all the units in the population are put into, a, say, a sampling frame or simply in simple random sampling, you would put them in a hat, as it were. And as you would pick up in a lottery a number, you would pick up the number of people that you want. So simple random sampling is simply choosing by a lot the, your, your sample. Uh, another way of doing it is you have your sampling frame. Now what is sampling frame? Sampling frame is a list of the units in the population. And every unit has been assigned a number, let us say, just for a sequential number. Then a computer can generate certain random numbers from this range of numbers. And then you choose these numbers for your research as participants in that sample. So you have the population. And population is all the units of your research, but you want to sample a few from uh, this population. And the way to sample is what we are talking about here. And the first way of uh, sampling is simple random sampling where you choose by lot, either physically or by a computerized technique. The second method of random sampling is called systematic random sampling. 
Let us say you have a thousand units in your sampling frame in the list of your population and you want a hundred people. So if you divide a thousand by a hundred, you get ten. Then you can decide to take every tenth person or tenth unit in your sampling frame and then that will give you uh, a sample of 100 uh, participants, 100 units for research. And this is called systematic. Unlike simple random sampling where you put all the units together and choose as it were like a lot, like a lottery, in, in systematic random sampling you have a criterion. You say you're going to choose every tenth person or you're going to choose uh, rather in terms of every three person but you will divide that again further and things like that. And the third technique of ra random sampling or probability sampling is called the clustered sampling. Or, and the fourth would be stratified sampling. We can look at stratified sampling and cluster sampling together. These refer to sort of groups so, for example, let us say you have the universities in Kenya. These are the units of your population. And we can group these universities into public universities and private universities. And then you want to really take your sample uh, percentage according to the population. Let us say um, the public universities in Kenya add up to about 60% of the universities and private universities add up to 40% of the universities. Then your sample then will take also 60% of the universities that are public and 40% from those that are private. So let us say we have uh, 22 um, private universities and uh, 25 public universities. Now you are not going to study all the universities but you are going to sample and then proportionately you're going to sample them and this is called stratified sampling because you're going by the strata the way they are divided and maybe within the private universities you might take faith-based universities and non-faith-based just private investment universities and then you keep sampling them according to that type of strata or the levels of division or if we take Kenya as a population, we can talk about the counties. And within the counties, you want to then go for maybe ethnic population, ethnic groups. Within the ethnic population, you want to go for gender. Within the gender, you might want to go for age criteria. What are you doing? You are sampling according to the different strata in which the society is stratified. That is called strat stratified uh, sampling. Now, clustered sampling refers to again dealing with groups. Let us say uh, a group that is internally heterogeneous, which means you go to an estate, a gated estate, where there are 20 uh, houses, and these 20 households are from different ethnic groups. So, instead of going by stratified sampling, whereby you are going to get representations from different strata, in, by taking one cluster, one group, you are going to get all those representatives in one go. And this is called clustered sampling. Of course, it depends on the situation where you would justify a stratified sampling, where you would do a, a clustered sampling. One important difference between stratified sampling and cluster sampling is in stratified sampling, each group is internally homogeneous and externally heterogeneous. What does it mean? Internally, people in this group are the same kind of belonging to same ethnic group or another criteria. But when they are compared with another group, they are different, they are heterogeneous. Whereas in cluster, you have many groups that are similar to each other, but within the group, you have different types of people. And so by choosing one group, you're having access to different types of participants. And therefore, you would go for cluster sampling in that case.
So now, these are all random sampling, actually. And the advantage of random sampling is that random sampling are probability sampling, and they give us a possibility to generalize. And so then you will see how you actually recruit your participants. Uh, often, uh, students forget to describe how they recruit participants. The way you can uh, recruit participants is to go through gatekeepers, we call gatekeepers, people who give access to a population. Or you might want to put up an advertisement on the notice board in a university that you are conducting a research and you want people to go there. Or you go, if you are doing a probability sampling, then you will have to uh, really have access to people who will give, uh, who will facilitate this possibility. And the last point about uh, sampling is that when we talk about a research, we are also talking about different levels of sampling within the same research. And we need to be aware of that. For instance, let us say my research uh, question is, what is the level of the use of e-resources, online resources for learning in the universities in Kenya? So my first level of sampling is all the universities in Kenya. Now, so let us say I sample four universities, two rural universities, two urban-based universities, fine. And I have done that through random sampling. Now, within the universities, we have faculties. Now, I have to sample faculties within the universities. Now, within the faculties, we have departments. So, how many departments do I choose from these four universities? And within the uh, departments, we have courses or classes or cohorts. How many do I want to sample? And within the classes or courses or modules, I have students. So, how many students do I want to uh, sample? We have to be very transparent in the way we are explaining the levels of sampling, what techniques have been used, and what was the sample size. Now, how do we determine the sample size? This is a uh, debatable point, and there are formulas that you can use. You can see in your screen one formula that is uh, most used in the U.S., particularly recommended by the American National Educational Association. And uh, they are being published in journals as a standard way of uh, really determining the sample size. So what I would suggest is that if you want to determine a sample size, you use one of these formulas that are published and you follow that formula and you show in your research that this is exactly what you did. And therefore, that will justify your sample size. The importance of uh, determining sample size is needed, particularly in prevalence questions. When you want to establish correlational questions or comparison of means, often we don't need to be so meticulous about the sample size, provided you are able to arrive at a significant result. So how big should a sample be? It's a very relative question unless you are trying to establish how prevalent is a proper uh, problem within a particular population. Then you will have to determine the sample size and you have to go through a rigorous way of sampling procedure. But often if we are doing a sort of an exploratory or correlational study, we don't need to break our heads over the sample size and sampling techniques. Uh, provided you are able to argue your case and justify why you went uh, for a particular technique of sampling and a particular sample size. Uh, in experiments though, often we need to determine the effect size as they say. To arrive at a significant result, we should have a, a particular number of participants and there are formulas to calculate that. So just be aware that the whole topic of sample size is very complex. Uh, to begin with, as an undergraduate student, I would propose that you go for one formula uh, and you just follow that formula. Secondly, the sample size becomes an important question when you are referring to a research question that deals with prevalence of trying to establish the extent of a problem.